Biraz önce bahsettiğim e, e, ve her kongrede bir e, yabancı e, konuşmacımıza, dostumuza verdiğimiz ömür boyu teşekkür belgesini e, yönetim kurulu olarak e, Sayın Bergamiski'ye uygun bulmuştuk. Konuşmasından önce takdim etmek istiyorum. Ondan sonra konuşması var, konferansı var ve arkasından bizim e, Profesör Metin Bey'in başka bir gösterisi var. Sonuçta o belgeyi şimdi takdim etmek istiyorum. I am touched and honored by this uh, the privilege to be here. I'd like to thank all, all, the, all the friends and, uh, and all the committees that, been, that are behind this organization. Uh, I'm pleased to come back. And, uh, and actually, I'd like, to, I, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for allowing me to speak on something that is not surgery, but is really another of the uh, activities that I do, which is being an editor. So, I, I promise I will not be boring, and I will not speak about statistics, but I will generally speak about how, uh, at least, you know, personally, I see um, scientific submission from surgeons. As you know, I work, uh, I used to work uh, at State University of New York on Long Island for nine years. I was there with, uh, this is a personal view, with Marvin Corman a great teacher, and this was my office. The speech is taken from one of my residents, you know, to show how I work hard. And uh, a, year, a year later, uh, last year, I moved actually to uh, New York Medical College, uh, which is a very old uh, university, a private university, uh, built in 1863. Um, and uh, the, the claim to fame of New York Medical College is actually that they graduated uh, the first uh, American woman, Emily Stowe, and uh, the first black American woman, Susan McKinley, as a doctor in the 1800s. Um, my talk would be uh, divided in two parts. What we should not do, because it won't work, and what may work when you submit an article. So let's start with what will definitely not work. Uh, the literature in surgery, uh, and particularly, you know, in the last 20 years uh, since, since I've been involved, is full of claims. Um, all, of, of course, also incompetence, and of course the, the worst part is the disingenuous part. What are the claims? One of the most common claims is the first case. Um, I've done the first case and I want to publish the article. The second is that I have done the largest series and when I published the article. And then one of the most common recently is the conclusion that what I do is safe and, and feasible. Let's look, for example, at this report. I anonymized, I de-identified. This is somebody that said I've done three cases uh, of a robotic rectalectomy and wants to publish. Now, this is a great book that I suggest that the young, the young surgeons to read is about how to write and publish papers in medical science. This book speaks about the test, it's called the Who Cares Test. I definitely think that the previous paper would not be published in a very good journal because it would not pass the Who Cares Test. So you need to think, who is gonna care about this article? But the first case is actually not a joke. The first case is a very serious business, at least in the United States. Uh, this organization, IDLD, D stands for device. It's an organization that started in the UK and now it's working in the United States with the FDA, that every time there is a new device and a surgeon wants to do a new procedure, first case, it's a huge amount of work. Just to give you an idea, they have phase one, two, three, four, etc. I'm not going to bore you with that. But let me give you an example. This is Jeff Milson, colorectal surgeon at Cornell in Manhattan. He had an idea, I think he's working with the Japanese, to 
perform an endoscopic uh, excision, I should say, of a colon cancer. For example, in, in elderly patients, they wouldn't tolerate a, a radical colectomy. And he went through a lot of stuff, like look at this, animal models. He got an approval, it's called 510K, it's an approval from the FDA. And then the IRB, and finally did the first in human. So first in human is a concept, but it's a much different thing than a claim. The largest series. So the largest series is really sometimes looked with irony when you think of two, two friends, you know, that have a big, a big fish. And it's not really going beyond that. For example, let's look at this paper. It's a paper that has 40, 45 cases. And in 45 cases, wants to claim that this is the largest series in England or Hornia. Probably in New York, there are more than 45 cases you know, in a day or, or in a week. So who's going to publish this? However, retrospective studies are important. You know, we, we need to value retrospective studies, but we need to acknowledge two things that are very important with retrospective studies. One, that the data are already existing. We are not collecting them now because we decided to do a study. And also that they were collected or recorded by someone else for other purposes than research. For example, billing, administrative, advertisement. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but there is a plethora of papers from administrative databases with the 350,000 patients, you know. And the, there's a lot of confusion about these papers because they have a huge sample size and you can actually buy them for a, a fair amount of money. And um, they seem to be looked upon as the real world data because they are not randomized, you know, they're not selected. But the problem is that the, the quality of the data is only collected for, for billing. Basically, these are government, uh, United States government uh, administrative databases. They have very few details. So you can use them to study the difference uh, between, I don't know, uh, Dr. Emre Gorgon uh, in Cleveland and me in terms of our household and uh, the size of the backyard, uh, geography, but you can't use them to study recovery in, the, say, uh, bowel function or uh, surgical site infection in colorectal surgery. And another thing that is really very important about these administrative databases, don't, don't get fooled, is the so-called p-value hacking, meaning that they're cheating on p-value. Why? Because when you have 350,000 patients, even a different two hours of a hospital stay becomes a, a positive, a significant p-value. So be very careful in believing uh, what is called the goose chase. Don't believe the p-value in these administrative databases. But they are all not all bad. Because Nesquip, for example, it's an, an administrative database that is not administrative. It's a database that is not owned by the government. It's, it's controlled by the American College of Surgeons. And the, the good thing about uh, Nesquip is that the data are not collected by me, meaning I collect my data and I publish my data, then it's suspicious because I may be not inclined to publish certain complications that I had. So the American College has nurses. They are research nurses. They are coming to your hospital and they are collecting the data. And they don't report to you, so you can't tell them what to do. Now, this is, this is Stony Brook, where I was in 2008. When I arrived, they showed me this picture. Stony Brook had 35% infection in colorectal surgery. That's how I started it. So one of the worst hospitals, basically. Let's change subject. Safe and feasible. That's another uh, very common conclusion. If you look at the PubMed, as I did, there are over 20,000 conclusions safe and feasible in, in, in surgery. Let me give an example, again, de-identified. So this is a paper that speaks, uh, has an a, a aim that says we present our early experience. That's the aim, which is not an aim. And they have 15 patients. 
Now, in, in colorectal surgery, we close a lot of ileostomy. This is a very common procedure to do. And the conclusion is that it's safe and feasible to send the patient home the next day. And I, I don't think that I would like to be sent home the next day after a loop ileostomy closure. This feels like uh, it's a, it's, it's a um, how should I say, government-run healthcare you know, problem to send the patient home where it's not good for the patient. And I'll leave it to that. But safely studies actually exist. They are defined by the FDA and they're actually trials. And they are, the purpose of safety trial is to assess very common complications. In 2017, this database showed that the top best patient safety studies that were published, none was from us, none was from surgery. A feasibility study actually exists. And what it is in truth is a, a trial that tries a piece of a future randomized to control trial. So if you wanna plan on doing a randomized to control trial in Turkey, you can do a feasibility study to study, for example, say the discharge, or say the uh, recovery, uh, first two hours in recovery. You can start studying pieces of the trial, as opposed to a pilot, which is a miniature randomized control trial, where you wanna put 10 patients just to see how they will work before you actually go to the full sample size. Uh, Bertrand Milla, uh, one of the great surgeons that I always uh, uh, appreciate, wrote this great uh, editorial back a long time ago on surgical endoscopy, saying the feasibility hazard basically don't provide any inf information. Now, the next chapter is incompetence. The first one is, uh, I wanna speak about this time. But let's speak about an example. Uh, this is a, a meta-analysis that I did with some residents a long time ago now. I wanted to know how accurate are the recurrence rates in rectal prolapse. Because in rectal prolapse, we always are concerned about the prolapse coming back. And so we, we have four papers and published, and we, and we look at the data. The first paper, I can say, is from Rich Nelson and Helen Abkarian in Chicago. And it was actually the only paper that claimed the 15% recurrence, and I re-estimated the reductuarial analysis, and it was actually correct. The second paper from the British Journal of Surgery published at 2.5, actually it was four. It's not too bad, but it gets worse. Surgical endoscopy, a paper claiming 9.6% recurrence rate on 100, over 100 patients has actually a recurrence rate of 36%. And then it gets even worse. In disease of the colon rectum, in 1999, there was a paper that published a recurrence of seven, is actually for 54%. The point is this, recurrence is not a ratio. If you have 10 patients recurring over 100, it is not 10 divided by 100. It is an estimation time. So you need to have, use actuarial analysis because if a patient gets hit by a bus, and dies, it has to be censored. So it's gonna be 100 minus one. So it becomes 99. Seems very simple. Another interesting uh, effect goes under the name of Hawthorne. So I cannot believe that JMA Surgery published this paper where they compare your operative report from last year to you being observed and being informed to operate and take a video of your operation, claiming how you get better if they are watching you. Of course you get better. You get better because you know you're watched, so you change your behavior. And this is called the Houghton effect. This is the worst part. The bandwagon effect, the spin, which is uh, coming from a finger hut, and the analysis. You know, the bandwagon is like carnival, where everybody gets on board. But in, in, uh, in editorial work in surgery, we call the bandwagon effect the desire of somebody to be, to be conforming to people, to others, to be fashionable, although the idea is not proven. 
The three major examples I want to bring are all in colorectal surgery just because I only do colorectal surgery. One is the peritoneal lavage story on uh, uh, peritonitis from uh, diverti perforated diverticulitis with peritonitis. The other one is the so-called ventral rectopexy. And the other one is the transcendental TME for rectal cancer. So quickly, in 1907, a Dr. Mayo, who became the founder of the famous Mayo Clinic, was doing this already for perforated diverticularis. But nobody has ever quoted him for some reason. And uh, to make the long story short, uh, this is the Lancet paper from 2015, where in case you don't know, the IRB, it means the uh, ethical committee, has stopped the trial at 33% of, uh, 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 you know, inclusion of patients due to the mortality rates in the lavage group. Changing to ventral rectopexy, Dr. Corman, whom you know needs no introduction, has told me that the adjective uh, posterior or, or anterior or ventral, whatever you like it, is actually referring to where the mesh is suspended. So if you suspend the mesh on the sacrum, it's called posterior. If you suspend the mesh on the pubis, it's called anterior. Makes sense. Now, in 1960, Deutscher, a Swiss surgeon, already published this. And Niagara, in 1970, already published ventral rectopexy, where the mesh was attached to the pubis. It didn't work, so it was abandoned. So I think the only great work is from, uh, uh, I, I think you know Larberg, is a great, great researcher from Denmark. And instead of uh, looking at uh, recurrence rate, he looked at function. Because the, the claim against posterior rectopexy is actually constipation, postoperative constipation. So he did a, a randomized control trial. You can say it's small, it's got only 75 uh, patients, but it's in Denmark. It's a small country. And he compared the, ventral retopexy to the classical posterior retopexy. And his conclusion was that absolutely no difference. Ventral retopexy is not superior in function. Now, sometimes things get really worse and there is a government that is, it has to step in and this is in Scotland where this posterior retopexy, this, uh, I'm sorry, ventral retopexy gets so bad that it was uh, prohibited for some time. Changing subject, going to transcendental TME. So as soon as this procedure um, came around, or grabbed the headlines, as they call it, uh, there was a, a surgeon who wrote this uh, uh, letter to the editor, uh, piece in the letter, where he, he reacted and said, uh, snobbing, and he said, you perforate the rectum, and then you want to fix it. Don't you have a risk of local recurrence? The pragmatic response always comes from Scandinavia. In, in January night this year, the Norwegian National uh, Association reported uh, a nearly 20% local recurrence after transcendental TME. And the most important is not the recurrence rate only, is the focal. So this is not a single location. This is a multifocal local recurrence. Uh, and it's also uh, as early as weeks. I lived uh, 10 years in Norway. I can tell you one thing about Norwegians. They are very honest, so I believe they're there. Now there is a, a, you can go to clinical trials, sometimes I do to check what's going on, and uh, they just, uh, just clinical trials uh, access you know, a, few, a few days ago, suspended uh, a trial uh, comparing transnational TME to laparoscopic TME for, for, for rectal cancer. I don't know why, the, the website doesn't say why. Abe Fingerhut spoke about spin. Spin means uh, like an atom, you turn it around. And he said that spin is actually the art of changing something that's not significant to still be okay because it's, it's what, what you believe. This is a great article about spin showing there are 25% of papers that are spinning the, the, the results because they like it. But the most uh, uh, famous, I would say, is color one. I was in Trondheim in 1996 when, uh, when uh, um, 
colors one was started and uh, the conclusion of the disease free uh, survival was very close so basically despite the large number of patients not significant the the important thing is that if you do a randomized control trial you need to accept that you don't know which one is best I'll, if you do a trial but you already think that one or the other is best it's not honest so the point that i'm highlighting here is that they're saying that although the difference is not significant you still can do a laparoscopic surgery and then someone else has to do of course another randomized control trial this is called spin analysis a finger out again I borrowed this slide from him. The Lancet 2002 paper, I think, is well known to everybody, claiming that laparoscopic surgery is better than uh, open surgery for colon cancer in terms of survival uh, and disease, I mean, cancer related survival at three years. And here's what Abe Finger has said they took 12 patients that were assigned to the laparoscopic arm. And because they thought this patient may have invasion of an adjacent organ, they switched them over to, to open surgery. And then they analyzed the 12 patients that were very difficult cases. They analyzed in the open group to make the open group look bad or to make the laparoscopic look group good better. So what makes it a winning submission? I think you should be honest to yourself. If you have an hypothesis, you should believe in the uncertainty. We should believe, you should believe that one thing is not better than the other. You don't know. That's why you're doing the study. Somebody should care about this study. You should power it uh, using uh, some style and do justice to others. Now, I'm going to conclude this with the most co common conclusion is my study is safe and feasible, but someone else has to do a randomized control trial. This is what we read every single week when we receive papers. I think it's important to know that most of the time, randomized control trials are not necessary. And there is actually a mathematical way to know. I'm not going to go into that now. I don't want to bore you with that. Most important is also to understand that randomization is biased. It's biased in favor of your pretrial routine. If you have done 10,000 open colectomies and you have done 20 laparoscopic, you know, you know that there is bias. And also is biased in favor of technical, simple uh, operation. There was a Swedish surgeon that said this in 1980. But if you want to do a randomized trial, you should blind. This is a paper with uh, a Dutch group that we published about laparoscopic surgery and open surgery, and that's how we're blinding the patients. I leave you, this is my last slide, that the learning curve is not a valid justification of patient injury. This is the law in New York. Thank you.